Okay. Just getting the final announcements out, and then we should be good to go. See Tabby already in the uh, chat room, so thank you for that, Tabby. I appreciate it. And we got one more thing to do here. And there we go. Create a post. Do this there, do that there, and post. Okay. How is everyone doing tonight? Good, I hope. We're, uh, hey, Skippy. Hey, Tabby. Um, so, yeah, we're getting down to the, the actually, the kind of, oh, let me, let me get rid of this. There we go. Uh, yeah, we're getting down to the end of this, this particular story. It's a little weird. Um, wasn't expecting that to be the case. There we go. Um, so, yeah, so it looks like the next book is probably going to be uh, Christmas Carol, just in time for the holidays. And uh, that is, if this tracks, let's see, we'll do 19 to 21 tonight, 21 to 23, yeah, 21 to 23, uh, no, 23 to 24, 25. Hmm. Twenty uh, nineteen to twenty one tonight. Twenty two to twenty four on on Thursday, and then Sunday we'll do twenty five and my review of the uh, of the book, and then uh, that'll make next Tuesday. Oh my God! Really, next Tuesday the start of a Christmas Carol. Uh, what I need to do is I got to figure out how many different chapters we're going to end up uh, recording for that, but we'll go from there. Okay, so let's uh, let's get going. It's about five past seven. We'll just go from there. All right, flip it over to story time view, so you can concentrate on the the fire and just chill out. Okay. Previously on Tom Swift and his motorboat. Basically, Tom found the arrow and he was chasing it down Lake Carlopa. And they ran ashore and Tom ran the red streak ashore in an effort to chase them into the woods. Chapter 19. A quiet cruise. Have they done any damage? Asked Mr. Damon as he stood in the bow of the Red Streak. Tom did not answer for a moment. He trained uh, His trained eye was looking over the engine. They yanked out the high-tension wire instead of stopping the motor with the switch, he answered at length. And then when he had taken a look into the compartment where the gas tank was, he added, And they've ripped out two more of the braces I put in. Why in the world they did that, I can't imagine. That's evidently what one man had that the others wanted, was Mr. Damon's opinion. Probably, agreed Tom, but what could he or they want with the wooden braces? That was a puzzler for Mr. Damon, but he answered, Perhaps they wanted to damage your boat and get those two men were and, and those two men were mad because the other got ahead of them. Taking out the braces wouldn't do much damage. I can easily put others in. All it would do would to be cause the tank to sag down and maybe cause a leak in the pipe. But that would be a queer thing to do. No, I think there's some mystery that I haven't gotten to the bottom of yet. But I'm going to. Good, exclaimed Mr. Damon. I'll help you, but can you run your boat back home? Not without fixing it a bit. I must brace up that tank and put in new high-tension wire from the spark coil. 
I can do it here, but I'd rather take it to the shop. Besides, with two boats to, to run back, be, I, for I must return to Andy's. Uh, oh, wow. That was a clunky, clunky sentence. Let me try that one again. <laughs> Besides, with two boats to run back, for I must return Andy's to him, I don't see how I can do it very well unless you operate one, Mr. Damon. Excuse me, but I can't do it. Bless my slippers, but I would sure be sure to run on a rock. The best plan will be for you to tow your boat, and I'll ride in it and steer. I can do that much anyhow. You can ride in the red streak. Tom agreed that this would be a good plan. So, after temporarily bracing up the tank and the arrow, it was shoved out into the lake and attached to Andy's craft. But aren't you going to make a search for those men? asked Mr. Damon when Tom was ready to start back. No, I think it would be useless. They are well away by this time, and I don't fancy chasing them through the woods, especially as night is coming on. Besides, I won't leave these boats. No doubt you're right, but I would like to see them punished, and I am curious enough to wish to know what the object that scoundrel could have in ripping out the blocks that served as a brace for the tank. I feel the same way myself, commented the lad, especially since this is the second time that's happened. But we'll have to wait, I guess. A little later, the start back was made. Mr. Damon steering the arrow skillfully enough so that it did not drag on the leading boat in which Tom rode. His course took him not far from the lake sanitarium where Mr. Duncan, the hunter, had been brought, and desiring to know how the wounded man was getting on, the youth proposed that they make a halt, explaining to Mr. Damon his reason. Yes, and while you're about it, you better telephone your father to let, you, let him know you'll join him tomorrow, suggested the other. I know what it is to fret and worry. You can fix your boat up in time to go to Sandport tomorrow, can't you? Yes, I'm glad you reminded me of it. I'll tele telephone him from the sanitarium, if they'll let me. Mr. Duncan was not at the institution, Tom was told, his injury having healed sufficiently to allow of his being removed to his home. The youth readily secured permission to use the telephone and was soon in communication with Mr. Swift. While not telling him all the occurrences that had delayed him, Tom gave his father and Ned Newton enough information to explain his absence. Then the trip to Shopton was resumed in the two boats. "'What are you going to do about your automobile?' asked Tom as they neared the point where the machine had been left. "'Never mind about that,' replied Mr. Damon. "'It will do good to have a night's vacation.' I will go on to your house with you, and perhaps I can get a train back to my friend's home, so that I can claim my car. Won't you stay all night with me? invited the young inventor. I'd be glad to have you. Mr. Damon agreed, and Tom, putting on more speed on the red streak, was soon opposite his own dock. The arrow was run in the boathouse, and the owner hastily told Mrs. Baggert and the engineer what, it had, what had occurred. Then he took Andy's boat to Mr. Foger's dock and warmly thanked the red-haired lad for the use of his craft. "'Did you find your boat?' asked Andy eagerly. "'How did the red streak run?' "'I got my boat, and yours runs fine,' explained Tom. "'Good. I'll race you again some day,' declared Andy. Mr. Damon enjoyed his visit at our hero's house, for Mrs. Baggert cooked one of her best suppers for him. Tom and the engineer spent the evening repairing the motorboat, Mr. Damon looking on and exclaiming, Bless my shoe leather, or some other part of his dress or anatomy, at every stage of the work. The engineer wanted to know all about the men and their doings, but he could supply no reason for their queer actions regarding the braces under the gas tank. In the morning, Tom once more prepared for an early start for Sandport, and Mr. Damon, reconsidering his plans, rode as far with him as the place where the automobile had been left. There he took leave of the young inventor, promising to call on Mr. Swift in the near future. "'I hope you arrive at the hotel where your father is without any more accidents,' remarked the automobilist. "'Bless my very existence, but you seem to have the most remarkable series of adventures I'd ever heard of.' They are rather odd, admitted Tom. I don't know that I particularly care for them either. But now that I have my boat back, I guess everything will be all right. But Tom could not look ahead. He was destined to have still more exciting times, as presently will be related. 
Without further incident, he arrived at the Lakeview Hotel in Sandport that evening and found his father and Ned very glad to see him. Of course, he had to explain everything then, and with his son safely in his sight, Mr. Swift was not so nervous over the recital as he would have been had Tom not been present. Now, for some nice quiet trips, remarked the lad when he had finished his account. I feel as if I had cheated you out of part of your vacation, Ned, staying away as long as I did. Well, of course we missed you, answered his chum, but your father and I had a good time. Yes, and I invented a new attachment for a kitchen boiler, added Mr. Swift. I had a chance for it when I passed through the hotel kitchen one day, for I wanted to see what kind of range they used. I guess there's no stopping you from inventing, replied his son with a laugh and hopeless shake of the head. But don't let it happen again when you go away to rest. Oh, I only just thought of it, said Mr. Swift. I haven't worked out the details yet. Then he wanted to know about everything at home, and he seemed particularly anxious lest the happy Harry gang do some damage. I don't believe they will, Tom assured him. Garrett and Mrs. Baggert will be on guard. The next few days were pleasant ones for Tom, his father, and Ned Newton. They cruised about the lake, went fishing, and camped in the woods. Even Mr. Swift spent one night in the tent and said he liked it very much. For a week, the three led an ideal existence, going about as they pleased, Ned taking a number of photographs with his new camera. The Arrow proved herself a fine boat, and Tom and Ned, when Mr. Swift did not accompany them, explored the seldom-visited parks of Lake Carlopa. The three had been out one day and were discussing the necessity of returning home soon when Ned spoke. "'I shall hate to give up this life and to go slaving in the bank again,' he complained. I wish I was an inventor. Oh, we inventors don't have such an easy time, said Mr. Swift. You never know when trouble's coming. And he little imagined how near the truth he was. A little later, they were at the hotel dock. When Tom had tied up his boat, the three walked up the path to the broad veranda that faced the lake. A boy in uniform met them. Someone has just called you on the telephone, Mr. Swift, he reported. Someone who wants me. Who is it? I think he said his name is Jackson, sir. Garrett Jackson. And he says the message is very important. Tom, something's happened at home, exclaimed the inventor as he hurried up the steps. I'm afraid there's bad news. Unable to still the fear in his heart, Tom followed his father. End of chapter 19. So we're going to go back and take a look at the chat room here. How is everyone tonight? So, Tabby, you're all caught up, right? And I think, uh, Skippy, I'm pretty sure you're caught up now, right? At least I think so. All right. Back to the story. Previously on Chapter 19 of, of Tom Swift in his motorboat. Uh, basically, Tom got the boat back. They found that the braces were once again missing, and Tom had to recreate them again. Uh, so they got the boats back home. Tom stopped, saw his dad, and they basically had a week of vacation with nothing bad happening. Until a phone call came from Mr. Swift, and there's trouble at home. Chapter 20. News of a Robbery with a hand that trembled so he could scarcely hold the receiver of the telephone, Mr. Swift placed it to his ear. Hello, hello, he cried into the transmitter. Yes, this is Mr. Swift. Yes, Garrett, what is it? Then came a series of clicks, which Tom and, and Ned had listened to. The inventor spoke again. What's that? The same men? Broke in early this evening? Oh, that's too bad. Of course, I'll come at once. 
There followed more meaningless clicks, which Tom wished he could translate. His father hung up the receiver, turned to him, and exclaimed, I've been robbed again. Robbed again? How, Dad? By that same rascally gang, Garrett thinks. This evening, when he and Mrs. Baggert were in the house, the burglar alarm went off. The indicator showed that the electrical shop had been entered and the engineer hurried there. He saw a light inside and the shadows of persons on the windows. Before he could reach the shop, however, the thieves heard him coming and escaped. Oh, Tom, I should never have come away. But did they take anything, Dad? Perhaps Garrett frightened them away before they had a chance to steal any of your things. Did you ask him that? I didn't need to. He said he made a hasty examination before he called me up, and he's sure a number of my electrical inventions are missing. Some of them are devices I'd never had patents for, and if I lose them, I'll have no recovery. But just what ones are they? Perhaps we can send out a police alarm tonight. Garrett couldn't tell that answered Mr. Swift as he paced to and fro in the hotel office. He doesn't know all the tools and machinery I had in there, but it's certain that some of my most valuable things have been taken. Never mind. Don't worry, Dad. And Tom tried to speak soothingly, for he saw that his father was much excited. We may be able to get them back. How does Garrett know the same men stole the turbine model broke into the shop this evening? He saw them. One was Happy Harry. He's positive. The others, he didn't know, but he recognized the tramp from our description of him. Then we must tell the police at once. Yes, Tom, I wish you would telephone. I'll give you a description of things. No, I can't do that either, for I don't know what was stolen. I must go home at once to find out. It's a good thing the motorboat is here. Come, let's start at once. What's my bill here? And the inventor turned to the hotel proprietor, who had come into the office. I've suffered a severe loss and must leave at once. I'm very sorry, sir. I'll have it ready for you in a few minutes. All right, Tom. <laughs> Wrong voice. <laughs> All right. Tom, is your boat ready for a quick trip? Yes, Dad, but I don't like to make it at night with three in. Of course, it might be perfectly safe, but there's a risk, and I don't like to take it. Don't worry about the risk on my account, Tom. I'm not afraid. I must get home and see what I've been robbed. The young inventor was in a quandary. He wanted to do as his father requested and to aid him all he could, yet he knew that an all-night trip in the boat down the lake would be dangerous, not only from the chance of running on an unknown shore or into a hidden rock, but because Mr. Swift was not physically fitted to stand the journey. Come, Tom, exclaimed the aged inventor impatiently. We must start at once. Won't morning do as well, Dad? No, I must start now. I could not sleep worrying over what's happened. We will start at that instant. There came a low, rumbling peal of thunder. Mr. Swift started and peered from a window. There came a flash of lightning and another vibrant report from the storm-charged clouds. There, there's your bill, Mr. Swift, remarked the proprietor, coming up. But I would not advise you to start tonight. There's a bad storm in the west, and it'll reach here in a few minutes. Storms on Lake Carlopa, especially at this open and exposed end, are not to be despised, I assure you. But I must get home, insisted Tom's fa father. The lace curtain over the window blew almost straight out with a sudden breeze and a flash of lightning so bright that it reflected even in the room where the incandescent electrics were glowing, those are light bulbs to you and me, made several others jump. Then came a mighty crash, and with that the floodgates of the storm were opened, and the rain came down in torrents. Tom actually breathed a sigh of relief. The problem was solved for him. It would be impossible to start tonight, and he was glad of it, much as he wanted to get on the trail of the thieves. There was a scurrying on the part of the hotel attendants to close the windows, and the guests who had been enjoying the air out on the porches came running in. With a rush, a roar, and a muttering, as peal after peal of thunder sounded, the deluge continued. It's a good thing we didn't start, observed Ned. End. Oh, no, it isn't. That's just a weird page break. I thought there was an end there. <laughs> I should say so, agreed Tom. But we'll get off the first thing in the morning, Dad. 
Mr. Swift did not reply. But his nervous pacing to and fro in the hotel office showed how anxious he was to be at home again. There was no help for it, however, and after a time, finding to think that of reaching of finding that to think of reaching his house that night was out of the question, the inventor calmed down somewhat. The storm continued nearly all night, as Tom could bear witness, for he did not sleep well, nor did his father. And when he came down to breakfast in the morning, Mr. Swift plainly showed the effects of the bad news. His face was haggard and drawn, and his eyes smarted and burned from lack of sleep. Well, Tom, we, we must start early, he said nervously. I'm glad it's cleared off. Is, is the boat all ready? Yes, and it's a good thing it was under shelter last night, or we'd have to bail it out now. That would delay us. An hour later, they were underway, having telephoned to the engineer at the Swift home that they were coming. Garrett Jackson reported over the wire that he had notified the Shopton police of the robbery, but that little could be done until the inventor arrived to give a description of the stolen articles. And that will do little good, I fear, remarked Tom. Those fellows have evidently been planning this for some time and will cover their tracks well. I'd like to catch them not only to recover your things, Dad, but to find out the mystery of my boat and why the man took the tank braces. End of chapter 20. All right. So, too bad for that storm. back here a little bit uh, all right get stiggy with it welcome commander root welcome even though I think commander root is a bot I hope everybody's uh, doing well we've got one more chapter to do for tonight and I know these are pretty short chapters but uh, I think that that makes it more palatable. It's easier to listen to for a short period of time and then go about your business. That's all good. All right. And with that, let's get back to it. I will click this back over. Put this back up. Previously on Chapter 20. Turns out the workshops got robbed back home. Everybody's trying to get back home. There was a big storm that prevented them from leaving that night, but they got to get back home and find out who robbed them. It looks like it might have been Happy Harry and his gang. Chapter 21. The Balloon on Fire. Down Lake Carlopa speeded the arrow. Those on board watching the bank slip past as the motorboat rapidly cut through the water. "'What time do you think we ought to reach home, Tom?' asked Mr. Swift. "'Oh, about four o'clock, if we don't stop for lunch.' "'Then we'll not stop,' decided the inventor. "'We'll eat what we have on board. I suppose you have some rations?' And he smiled, the first time since hearing the bad news. "'Oh, yes. Ned and I didn't need everything on our camping trips.' And Tom was glad to note that the fine weather which followed the storm was having a good effect on his father. We certainly had a good time, remarked Ned. I don't know when I've enjoyed a vacation so. It's too bad it had to be cut short by this robbery, commented Mr. Swift. Oh well, my time would be up in a few days more, went on the young bank employee. It's just as well to start back now. Tom took the shortest route he knew, keeping in as close to the shore as he dared, for now he was as anxious as his father to get home. On and on speeded the arrow. Yet fast as it was, it seemed slow to Mr. Swift, who, like all nervous persons, always wanted to go wherever he desired to go instantly. Tom headed his boat around a little point of land and was urging the engine to the top notch of speed, for now he was on a clear course, with no danger from shoals or hidden rocks, when he saw, darting out from the shore, a tiny craft, which somehow seemed familiar to him. He recognized a particular putt-putter of the motor. That's the dot, he remarked in a low voice to Ned. Miss Nestor's cousin's boat. Is she in it now? asked Ned. Yes, Tom answered quickly. 
You've got good eyesight, remarked Ned dryly to the tell to tell a girl at that distance. It looks to me like a boy. No, it's Mary. I, I, I mean, Miss Nestor. The youth quickly corrected himself, and a close observer would have noticed that he blushed a bit under his coat of tan. Ned laughed. Tom blushed a little more, and Mr. Swift, who was in a stern seat, glanced up quickly. It looks as though that boat wants to hail us, the inventor remarked. Tom was thinking the same thing, for though he had changed his court slightly since sighting the dot, the little craft was put over so as to meet him. Wondering what Miss Nestor could want, but being only too willing to have a chat with her, the young inventor shifted his helm. In a short time, the two craft were within hailing distance. "'How do you do?' called Miss Nestor as she slowed down her motor. "'Don't you think I'm improving, Mr. Swift?' "'What? what what's that? I, I, I beg your pardon, but I didn't catch that.' exclaimed the aged inventor quickly, coming out of a sort of daydream. I beg your pardon. He thought she had addressed him. Miss Nestor blushed and looked questioningly at Tom. My father, he explained as he introduced his parent. Ned needed none, having met Miss Nestor before. Indeed, you have improved very much, went on our hero. You seem to be able to manage the boat all alone. Yes, I, I'm doing pretty well. Dick lets me take the dot whenever I want to, and I thought I'd come out for a little trial this morning. I'm getting ready for the races. I suppose you're going to enter them? And she steered her boat alongside Tom's, who throttled down his powerful motor so as not to pass his friend. Races? I hadn't heard of them, he replied. Oh, indeed, there are to be fine ones under the auspices of the Lanton Motor Club. Mr. Hastings, of whom you bought that boat, is going to enter his new Carlopa, and Dick has entered the dot, in the baby class, of course. But I'm going to run it, and that's why I'm practicing. I hope you win, remarked Tom. I hadn't heard of the races, but I think I'll enter. I'm glad you told me. Do you want to race now? And he laughed, and he looked into the brown eyes of Mary Nestor. No, indeed, unless you give me a start of several miles. They kept together for some little time longer, and then, as Tom knew his father would be restless at slow speed, he told Miss Nestor the need of haste, and advancing his timer, he soon left the dot behind. The girl called a laughing goodbye and urged him not to forget the races, which were to take place in about two weeks. I suppose Andy Foger will enter his boat, commented Ned. Naturally, agreed Tom. It's a racer, and he'll probably think it can beat anything on the lake. But if he doesn't manage his motor differently, it won't. The distance from Sandport to Shopton had been more than half covered at noon when the travelers ate a lunch in the boat. Mr. Swift was looking anxiously ahead to catch the first glimpse of his dock, and Tom was adjusting the machinery as finely as he dared to get it out, to get out of it the maximum speed. Ned Newton, who had happened to be gazing aloft, wondering at the perfect beauty of the blue sky after the storm, uttered a sudden exclamation. Then he arose and pointed at some object in the air. Look, he cried, a balloon. It must have gone up from some fair. Tom and his father looked upward. High in the air, almost above their heads, was an immense balloon. It was of the hot air variety, such as performers use in which to make ascensions from fairgrounds and circuses, and below it dangled a trapeze, upon which could be observed a man, only he looked more like a doll than a human being. "'I shouldn't like to be as high as that,' remarked Ned. "'I would,' answered Tom, and he slowed down the engine, the, and, and as he slowed down the engine, the better to watch the balloon. "'I'd like to go up in an airship.' and I intend to one day. I believe he's going to jump, suddenly exclaimed Ned after a few minutes. He's going to do something anyhow. Probably come down in a parachute, said Tom. They generally do that. No, no, cried Ned. He's not going to jump. Something's happened. The balloon is on fire. He'll be burned to death. Horror-stricken, they all gazed aloft. From the mouth of the balloon there shot a tongue of fire, and it was followed by a cloud of black smoke. The big bag was getting smaller and seemed to be descending, while the man on the trapeze was hanging downward by his hands to get as far away as possible from the ter terrible heat. 
end of chapter 21. Chapter 21, that is correct. Okay. So. That concludes tonight's recording. Um, it's funny, when, when we see the hot air balloon, and again, I haven't looked ahead. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here and keep streaming. Um, I, I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if the third book in the Tom Swift series is Tom Swift and his hot air balloon or something like that. <laughs> Tabby, you hate that ending. <laughs> well, it's all supposed to be pretty cliffhangery, right? Um, but there's only uh, that, that was end of tw chapter twenty-one. There's only four more chapters left. So that's why I was saying I think uh, next Tuesday is when uh, Christmas Carol will start, and I just have to figure out exactly how many chapters I'm going to end up reading per night of that. So, it's going to be a little weird, but we'll be in mid-November. It's not going to be that that bad. So, the only question is whether or not I'll be able to finish it in time for Christmas. Well, let me see here. Um, one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. We should definitely be able to finish. If I can get, if I can do three chapters a night of Christmas Carol, because uh, I, could, I could easily knock out 45 chapters in that time frame, if it is three chapters a night. Oh yeah, Tabby. I don't know. I, I'm only I'm doing voices now just to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, I don't know what I'll end up doing there. So I'm not going to pre-read it. I mean, I know the general story, but I'm not going to uh, read it ahead of time. I'm going to read it as if I started reading it to the to the kids or to my new grandbaby. So, anyhow. Um, Thank you for, for jumping in. I, I really do appreciate it. And I hope everything is good at home. Uh, Skippy, you too. I hope things are going well up there in Nova Scotia for you. And, uh, yeah, we will see you guys next time. Have a great evening. See ya.